Burns. Evaluating Josh Burns is Brett Patterson. Brett, could you tell us Josh's objectives today? Josh is doing project number one from the interpretive reading manual called Read a Story. Give you a little background on what this means. The purpose of an interpretive reader is to communicate through voice the work of an author. The interpretive reader's goal is to so enthrall the audience with a story that the audience isn't even aware of the reader. The reader makes the story come alive. His objectives, to understand the elements of interpretive reading, to learn how to analyze a narrative and plan for effective interpretation, to learn and apply vocal techniques that will aid in the effectiveness of the reading. His time is eight to 10 minutes. When Mr. Bilbo Baggins of Bag In announced that he would shortly be celebrating his 11th-first birthday with a party of special magnificence, there was much talk and excitement in Hobbiton. Today, Josh will be reading a short section from the first chapter of The Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. Josh Burns, a long-expected party, a long-expected party, Josh Burns. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters guests. As Eric said, I'll be reading from Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring. If you haven't read these books, if you've only watched the movies, read the books. They're better than the movies. And the movies were awesome. <coughs> the very month was September, and as fine as you could ask. A day or two later, a rumor, probably started by the knowledgeable Sam, was spread about that there were going to be fireworks. Fireworks were as more such as not been seen in the Shire for nigh on a century. Not indeed since the old took died. Days passed and the day drew nearer. An odd-looking wagon laden with odd-looking packages rolled into Hobbiton one evening and toiled up the hill to Bag End. The startled hobbits peered out of their lamplit doors to gape at. It was driven by outlandish folk, singing strange songs. Dwarves with long beards and deep hoods. A few of them remained at Bag Inn. At the end of the second week in September, a cart came in through Bywater from the direction of Brandywine Bridge in broad daylight. An old man was driving it all alone. He wore a tall, pointed blue hat a long gray cloak, and a silver scarf. He had a long white beard and bushy eyebrows that stuck out beyond the brim of his hat. Small hobbit children ran after the cart all through Hobbiton and right up the hill. It had a cargo of fireworks, as they rightly the guessed. At Bilbo's front door, the old man began to unload. There were great bundles of fireworks in all sorts of shapes, each labeled with a large red G and an elf room. That was Gandalf's mark, of course, and the old man was Gandalf the wizard, whose fame in the Shire was due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. His real business was far more difficult and dangerous, but the, fire, but the Shire folk knew nothing about it. To them, he was just one of the attractions at the party, hence the excitement of the Hobbit children. G for grand, they shouted, and the old man smiled. They knew him by sight, though he only appeared in Hobbiton occasionally and never stopped long. But neither they nor any but the oldest of their elders had seen one of his fireworks displays. They now belonged to the legendary past. When the old man, helped by Bilbo and some dwarves, had finished unloading, Bilbo gave a few pennies away, but not a single squib or cracker was forthcoming to the disappointment of the onlookers. Run away now, said Gandalf. We'll get plenty when the time comes. Then he disappeared inside with Bilbo, and the door was shut. <coughs> Young hobbits stared at the door in vain for a while, and then made off, feeling the day for the party would never come. Inside Bagnet, Bilbo and Gandalf were sitting at the open window of a small room looking out west onto the garden. The late afternoon was bright and peaceful. The flowers glowed red and golden, snapdragons and sunflowers, the 
nasturtiums trailing all over the turf walls and peeping in at the round windows. How bright your garden looks, said Gandalf. Yes, said Bilbo, I'm very fond indeed of it, and of all dear old Shire. But I think I need a holiday. You mean to go on with your plan then? I do. I made up my mind months ago, and I haven't changed it. Very well. There's no good saying any more. Stick to your plan. Your whole plan is mine. And I hope it will turn up for the best. For you and for all of us. I hope so. Anyway, I mean I mean to enjoy myself on Thursday and have my little joke. Who will laugh, I wonder, said Gandalf, shaking his head. We shall see, said Gandalf. The next day, more carts rolled up the hill, and still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week, orders began to pour out of bag end for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be obtained in Hobbiton or Bywater or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic and they began to tick off the days on the calendar. They watched eagerly for the postman, hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out, and the Hobbiton post office was blocked, and the Bywater post office was snowed under, and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on, thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at Bag End, no admittance, except on party business. Even those who had, or pretended to have party business were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy, writing invitations, taking off answers, packing up presents, and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find the, lar the large field south of Bilbo's front door covered with ropes and poles for tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank led, leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Row, adjoining the field, were intensely interested and generally in. Old Gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to work in his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion, so big that the tree that grew in the field was right inside it and stood proudly near one end at the head of the chief's table. Lanterns were hung on all its branches. More promising still, to the hobbit's mind, an enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field. A draft of cooks from every inn and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. Then, the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. Then Thursday, September 22nd, actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bil Bilbo Baggins colored a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there were even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new White Gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by a back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays. Not very expensive ones, as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbiton and Bywater, every day in the year it was somebody's birthday, so that every hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week. But they never got tired of it. On this occasion, the presents were unusually good. The hobbit children were so excited that for a while, they almost forgot about eating. 
There were toys the like of which they had never seen before, all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale and were a real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times, all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times, there were merely lots of people eating and drinking continuously from 11 seas until 6.30 when the fireworks were <coughs> The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but, the desi but designed and made by him. And the special effects, set pieces, and flights of rockets were let off by him. But there was also a generous dis distribution of squibs, crackers, back wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. The leaves opened like a whole spring and folded in a moment. And their shining branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished half hobbits disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies that flew glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles, or sailing ships, or a phalanx of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army and came down to the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise in honor of Bilbo, and it startled the hobbits exceedingly, as Gandalf intended. The lights went out. A great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain seen in the distance and began to glow at the summit. It spouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from his jaws. His eyes glared down. There was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned a somersault, and burst over a bywater with a deafening explosion. That is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leaped to their feet. All right, thank you, Josh. You take a moment and vote for who you thought did the best job at meeting their objectives with their speech. move on to the ever exciting table topics portion of our meeting. We do have a change of our table topic.